Hello and good morning. I am coming to you live from my cutting patch. Such a grand word. <laughs> if you're joining me live this morning, please leave me the hashtag live. And if you're catching up with me later on, leave me the hashtag replay and um, I'll have a chat with you in the comments. So I've decided to come out. It's half past eight in the morning. Surprisingly, we've actually got a blue sky after a period of persistent light to mid heavy rain. So I thought I would seize the moment where I can and get on with my 15 minutes worth of jobs in the garden. I have a question for you, all about mulch. Do you remember a few videos ago when my sister had come down and she gave me some sage advice after of course she picked herself up off the floor because she was laughing at my plans for an instant cutting garden and she did say that I should be putting 10 centimeters of mulch down on my garden but more about that in a moment first of all would you like to see what I've actually been doing this is the lilac tree, which for years and years, probably 20 years, has been um, overtaken by ivy to the extent that the tree was old when we moved into the house about 25 years ago and it had split and it's always been on its last legs. We've let the ivy grow up the, the tree. That gives a nice sort of screening between us and our neighbors. But the, every year, there's less and less lilac blooms. So what I've been trying to do, we've got this big gap here, which is where our bay tree used to be. And when we had the garden cleared, the bay tree was cut. I must admit, I think it was cut slightly more than both my husband and I envisaged. We thought it was going to be kept to about fence height, again, to soften the garden fence for next door, but it went right down to the base. In fact, I'm not quite sure whether you can see it there or not. So I don't want to cut the, well, the lilac tree down or to cut all the ivy off. Because again, I just feel a little bit exposed in my own garden. I want to sort of wait till this grows up, but keep it under control this time. It zooms up really high. It was probably about six metres high. If I kept it at nice two, two and a half, three metres, I'd be quite happy. So I don't want to have two bald spots on the side fence because um, our neighbour's garden is a little bit sunken. The fence is probably only one and a half metres high. I don't sort of want to have that sense that every time I go out into my garden, I'm sort of looking down onto them. And likewise, even though they can't really look into my garden, you know, I just want to have a little bit of privacy as they will do too. But I have done a little bit of cutting back. Let me see if I can bring you a tiny bit closer so you can see what I've been doing. So I've, just with my secateurs, actually my husband did let me, I asked him if I could use his battery operated chainsaw. It's a mini chainsaw. Um, I think perhaps the battery might have needed recharging, but I did have a go with the chainsaw. But what I want to make sure is that ideally there's this huge bulge, it's sort of like a, a pregnant tummy. <laughs> of ivy that's hanging into my garden, I want to be able to lop all that off to give myself a straight sided ivy and leaving it looking more natural on the other side. Of course, there's so much ivy, the stems, I mean, they, they're huge. And I'm conscious of the fact that as I'm clipping away to give me more space in my side of the garden, it may well be that I'm cl um, clipping a vital lifeline and actually the ivy's dying, but I'm just trying to do it you know, little and often trying to do it. So it's not such a huge job, and also to protect our mutual privacy. But the one thing I have been managed to do is that I have discovered that the lilac isn't as dead as I thought. So I've got this peculiar shaped bit here, which is sort of curling round to find the light. So I've got to, every time I get out my clippers, and especially that chainsaw, I almost feel like I need to tie a piece of red wool around the lilac that I want to keep because I don't accidentally want to chop it back. There's another piece there and then there's two big bits right at the top and it's trying to sort of investigate 
in the middle of all the ivy what I want to keep and what I don't want to keep. And the other thing that I have discovered, well, I knew already, that my husband had planted two climbing roses, rambling roses. I'm not entirely sure what the difference is between the two, but because the bay tree has been cut down and because I've exposed more space here, I've discovered them. So over here and just coming into flower a little spray rose that is orange yellow orange reddish and it says it's gelaine oh look i was right with the color it says it's a climber a gelaine de felling ond i shall take a picture of that later and put it in the community tab pages color orange yellow and then also here Again, sprawling. I did see this one flower this year. Again, a sort of spray looking rose, a really small flower with red petals and I think a white center. And this, oh, it's a, it's a climber, color pink. I wouldn't have put that down as pink. I thought it was red, but it says it's called a rambling rosy. And my husband has planted them, but this one he's taken the the bottom out of a plastic plant pot to sort of create a guard around the top. So there are, I have deadheaded this and I've got um, this much rose. And I guess the idea was it was going to climb into the bay tree. It was going to climb over the lilac tree, but they've just been smothered. So I'm hoping now that I have sort of cleared out a little bit underneath the ivy or I should call it the lilac tree that it is a little bit more open now the other thing I need to think about going forward is this is my neighbour's fence but I think this about 20 centimetres in is our actual boundary which lines up with our kitchen so we've kept well people that built the extension kept within the boundary my neighbor's kept within his boundary and i've ended up with this channel which is a hand spanned wide that's sort of a bit of a groove between the two properties i've got concrete here he's got concrete baseboards on his fence but i was wondering whether that might be a good place to plant some wild flower seeds I, the only thing I know about wild flower seeds is they like really poor soil don't they so I've had these visions of having a wild flower meadow in the garden and it doesn't work because the garden is too rich in nutrients we do leave our grass to go no mow may in a very um, curated kind of way sort of you leave a few patches but visions for wild flower meadow have never come to fruition as my husband tells me it's because there's, there's too much nutrient in our soil and especially because this used to be where our chicken run was uh, i think originally the people before the people we bought the house from i think this is where their vegetable patch was so i think it has been highly um nutritionalized over the intervening years but I did wonder whether in that sort of trough of no man's land where I think my soil has sort of swept off and filled in the groove a little bit that perhaps that might be quite poor soil and perhaps the the wildflowers might like it um, and I'm thinking perhaps even if I scatter some poppy seeds there the oriental poppies perhaps I could while I'm waiting for the bay to bush up perhaps I could have a backdrop next spring early summer of you know oriental poppies in the background so i have got a tiny bit of gardening to do before we get on to the mulch question and i've bought myself see i'm holding the tools of the job i bought myself and i must remember where to put them i'm going to put them in my back pocket but i have decided to get myself a little gardening truck together which i'll show you in a moment i do like going to charity shops and going to car boot fairs and we're trying to sort of slowly eradicate plastic from our garden or from our house. So I, I bought at the car boot fair. Actually, this wasn't, this was at um, a flower arranging thing. There was a bric-a-brac store and I bought for three pounds, a rather unusual looking basket. Um, so I've decided to use that as my gardening truck. So in there, I've got my secateurs, my floristry scissors, they're so good at snipping things. I've got my Sarah Raven book with my plant tags behind. So if you ask me a question about my plant names, I can quickly look up my book. And my gardening 
ourselves as well, just to sort of corral everything together. And because I'm trying to be like a 15 minute garden and not like this like massive chore, I just felt like I could sort of get into that lovely lifestyle and I could put my straw hat on and I could skip through my flower beds. But I just sort of want to be intentional and purposeful and therefore make gardening less like a chore and more like something that is an enjoyable part of my day. So do you want to see what I have been buying? So we have a market in town um, on a Tuesday, a Friday and a Saturday. And there's a plant stall on all those days. Is he there on the day? He's definitely there on a Tuesday. I never go on a, a Friday because I'm busy. And um, on a Saturday as well. So I went out early Saturday morning, about half past eight in the morning. And I was so early that he hadn't put out all his plants. And I was a bit disappointed because I thought this plant had sold out and I only saw a different kind of hydrangea. I did also go into town to get some flowers because I'm doing a project called... Do you know Julia Clements, the flower ranger, wrote books. She was sort of the avant-garde flower ranger of her day in the 1950s. And she sort of helped set up all the flower ranging clubs and societies. Well, I'm doing a project where I'm recreating all of her... Uh, flower arrangements, 85 of them, in her black and white book. So I kind of got my shopping list of things. As the seasons change, I need to go out and buy the flowers because, of course, I don't have a very floriferous garden. I think perhaps that is where the idea came from when I decided to grow my own flowers. That I've just realised what abundant flowers that she had access to. And it was probably, I think actually, to be honest, her flowers came from an estate out in the country. She talks about the gardener bringing them into town when she was in London. So I realised how little diversity in, in you know, the, the broad range of flowers I have access to. Normally when I teach my flower classes, I buy my flowers in the supermarket because I know that most of the others of you who are coming to class are also buying your flowers in the supermarket so I don't want to go overboard but it is ever so much more exciting when you can use flowers that have been grown by yourself or treat yourself and buy them from a flower farmer so I've decided that I wanted to have a hydrangea now, this is a bit of a risk this plant cost me 12 pounds so you know it was quite an investment um, and we don't have much luck with hydrangeas in our garden we have one again I've told you this before it's about a meter in all directions i think it's only got two flower heads on it so i don't quite know what we're doing wrong or perhaps our soil conditions don't like it so i have got this so we need to <laughs> look at the label and decipher what it says so i'm not even sure it's pan flora the make like the the, the the nursery i think it might be and it's hydrangea paniculata so what does paniculata mean now i don't know whether these are quite sort of conical blooms when you normally think of a hydrangea you think of the sort of more mounded ones and you do get those ones that have just got the little florets around the outside edge and they are sort of um more sparse in the middle so i've decided to go for a slightly different shape and it's green and you can see that the color is just starting to change it's getting a pinkish tinge so it's telling me that, well, is it, again, it's trying to decipher what all this means. It's got a flower head here and it says Roman numerals 6 to 10. Is that the growing zones in America? We don't use growing zones here in the UK. And I'm wondering whether that's a growing zone in America. I don't know. Secateurs, Roman numerals 1 to 3. Oh, it's good. Oh, I think that might mean it's a flower with a bee, so it's good for the pollinators. And then it's got frost. Does that mean frost resistant? And then, I don't know what that means. There's a little flower pot. Two little flower pots. <laughs> I know what that one means. Don't eat it. And then it's saying full sun and partial sun, and it will grow up to about a meter so it's the same one as my other one and it's got a watering can there oh and it does mature i think i've just discovered that the pale green flower to the pink flower so as the months move on it will mature so i am going to pot that up and i might just bring you round the corner to do that what i'm going to pot it up into is this metal bucket which i think might 
to belong to my dad. My husband has drilled holes in it, so it's got drainage. It's got the remains of a canna lily in it, and actually I was doing some vigorous re weeding, and I've actually weeded up and, um, a begonia, the elephant's ear, so I'll have to remember to replant that. So let's move round to my little planting station and we can get going. So, here is my little planting station. I'm supposed to be trying not to walk <laughs> on my soil because of my no dig. What's it? And um, I seem to be failing miserably. So, oh, don't put it on there because I need to plant it. I'm going to put it in there. So I've got some other things to show you a little bit later on. I've also got my rubbish bucket because when I got my compost and the compost heap, there's all sorts of bits of plastic in it, which isn't very good. So can you see, okay, with regard to what I'm doing? Just wondering if I can lift you up a little bit more. There we go. So, here's my garden truck. <laughs> and a top tip from my friend. She says she gardens with um, cutlery. And I quite like that idea. So, rather extravagantly, I have um, got these out of my kitchen drawer. And I think these came from my grandmother. And they've got, um, is it hallmarks on the back? So I never use them for anything. Actually, I think the only thing I do use them for, I think I have used the spoon before for gardening. So I thought, why don't I make these part of my gardening equipment? And then I can always be thinking of my granny as I do that. So what I have got here is I've got a bag of compost, which I discovered by our compost heap because I was scooping out my next batch of well rotted compost which has got obviously um coffee bags don't rot down very easily so that goes in my in my bucket there so i'm going to tip some of the compost into my truck and then i'm going to add in some of my well rotted garden compost Then, taking my bucket, I'm going to, I think that's rotted. Um, how am I going to do this? I might just tip that out. Like that. So is that kind of really going to do anything? I may have to seek my husband's advice on that. So I'm going to put that down there to keep it safe. And then, starting again. Now, you proper gardeners, would you be washing this out to sort of sterilise it? Or do you just sort of use it as you go? Perhaps you could let me know in the comments. So I do know I need my crocs, so I can reuse the crocs, which were in the, the bottom from last time round. And as I've been sort of doing a bit of light weeding and stuff, I've been correct collecting my little crocs too. Actually, I've got something to show you. So, this little bit of broken flower pot. So that is creating my drainage at the bottom. One thing I ha I'm not going to use, but I've spotted this in the garden. That's an archaeological find. So what's going on here? This looks like a paving slab. But can you see? got this little ball in it which comes out with a little dip so have I got a perfectly round crystal um, it's hard but it's rather bizarre so I'm saving it looks like some sort of mystery object doesn't it, it looks like a pearl obviously pearls don't grow in concrete blocks. There you go, mystery. So I'm, I'm sort of saving that. <laughs> Putting it here, safekeeping. So, 
I have, I'm going to take these two big bits out, they're too big. I'm going to rely on my small box and then tip in my mix of compost, bought compost and homegrown compost. I'm sort of filling it about a third full and bring it up to the sides in order that when I tip this out, I need to plant, my sister's advice ringing in my ears, I need to plant so the soil level is the same level as it was in the pot. You tickle the roots, is that what you do? Put that down in there and then I will need to back fill with my mixed compost. around the edges and give that a good watering. It takes a while, doesn't it? But I just want to sort of set myself a couple of jobs to do so it doesn't, again, it's that whole thing because gardening isn't in my blood. It's to make it achievable. Now I've run out of that mix so I'm just going to use my well-rotted compost from the garden for the top bit. I think I've done a third of that. Oops, I need a little bit of glass in the rubbish bin. Amazing what you do find in the compost heap. I will say I found quite a few sachets of flower food and now I realise my husband, how annoying it must have been when I wasn't particularly careful with my throwing away regime, you know, sorting out my plastic wrappers and the stuff that was truly compostable. But there's no flower foam. I think sometimes there used to be flower foam accidentally in the compost heap, but I have been absolutely rigorous about that. And of course, these days, I have really, really restricted I can't say I am foam free, but I've certainly you know, reduced my use of flower foam for my flower ranging by, you know, 95%. So that is all firmly fixed in. I will need to water that in, nice and heavy, and then go back and plonk it down where I'm going. And slowly, slowly, starting to creep slightly with my garden. See, I quite listened to this, but I think actually my husband was right. Start in one corner and then just slowly, slowly progress up. Now, mulch. So I'm not going to be using this. Oh, I'm just thinking now, more advice. What do you do with your spent compost from your pots? Can I just use that as mulch on my garden? Well, I'm asking, <laughs> but um, I am just going to. I mean, I, I'll just blame it on novice nerves. But what do you do with it when it's spent? Do you put it, do you put it on the compost heap? Do you, do you mulch with it? Um, I don't know. I, I guess, um, again, I, I'm trying to think on my feet. I guess the concern would be, isn't it, is it that I'm introducing something that's perhaps not so healthy for my soil, if I've got any pests or diseases. I'm, I'm pulling out the sort of rotten bit of calla, is it a corm? I don't quite know. Um, so there's nothing in there. And also, I suppose the concern is when you've composted something, um, you know, it's about having seeds and stuff, isn't it? I don't know, you can tell by my questions, I haven't got a clue what I'm talking about. But what do I do with this? I either put it on the compost heap to rot down or I put it on my garden to um, mulch the ground. Now, I've, I need to <laughs> mulch more deeply than I did. As I said at the beginning of the video, my sister advised me to mulch to 10 centimetres deep. In reality, I've mulched to five centimetres deep. And when I bring the camera around, you'll see that the mulch has its job. Now, part of the reason why I didn't mulch more deeply was because it was blinking hard 
work. So I first of all have to get the wheelbarrow out from where it's stored in our open sided shed. And then I have to, we've got a, a sort of little gate in front of our compost heap to stop the dog getting in there and going out to the other neighbour's garden because the hedge is quite thin at that point. And then there wasn't physically enough space to manoeuvre the garden shovel and remove the, the, the wheelbarrow. It gets got a bit complicated. So what I have done this morning is I've done a little light spring cleaning in the compost heap area. I think it's to, to, to the compost heap's advantage in terms of utilising it. But I am massively aware that the compost heap isn't my domain, it's my husband's domain. And he, you know, I'm sure if you're a, a real gardener, you will understand. But uh, what I've done is I just moved things, this little alcove in the corner of the garden out of view. But there've been lots of things that sort of been dumped. So there were sort of bits of old fence posts and things like that. And it got a bit dumping ground-esque, so all I've done is very neatly stacked up all these off-cuts of wood which are starting to rot, and I can see the, the wood lice and all that good um, wildlife biodiversity. But I've sort of stacked it up slightly neater, and I've moved, I think he might have been making something, it's quite hard to discern, a huge flower pot that was full of stuff with a, um, a tarpaulin at the top and a brick weighting it down. I don't know whether that was pure leaf mould he was creating. So I kind of had moved that because it was in the way. I couldn't get the wheelbarrow close enough to the compost heap. And now what I've actually done, instead of digging out the well-rotted compost, I've actually been digging on the floor in front of, because there's a little sort of concrete apron which I haven't seen for years because it's always covered with leaves and things like that so i scooped all the leaves off the surface and put those onto the compost heap that was the right thing to do wasn't it and then i've used my shovel a bit like shoveling snow to just sort of get back down to the surface of the concrete so i've managed to fill a wheelbarrow full of well rotted manure that was just happened to be overspill from the compost heap or just years of mis miss chucking on the compost heap so it's actually rotted down outside the compost heap so i am going to add this to the garden so let me bring you round and show you what i'm going to do oh one thing i have got to do to sort out and i'll probably do that a little bit later the fun i'm sure you all know this you know i love charity shopping i love going to um i love going to car boot fairs and all that kind of stuff and to my delight, I finally understand why my friends are always so excited when they see plants. But we were in um, Sandwich, which is a town near me, a very nice historic town, and I spotted some pots for sale on somebody's front doorstep. So I paid 50p each for three pots, so I spent £1.50. Prices do vary though, don't they, when people are selling on their doorsteps. So when I went to the car boot fair, yes, on Sunday, there was a lady selling um, plants that she'd obviously grown in her garden and she wanted £2.50 a pot. There was some Acamilla Mollis. I'm always Lady's Mantle, very popular for a sort of flower, um, foliage come flower in flower arranging, but it never survives in our garden. But I thought, now I've cleared out my, my cutting patch, perhaps there'd be less competition in terms of ground cover. But when I asked the price, she said £2.50 and I didn't want to pay £2.50. So this is... Verbena, oh, it's that long word I can't say, but she's written it. I'm presuming it's a lady from the writing. She's written it on three lines. Verbena Buenos, oh, Verbena Buenos Aires. Is that, um, I'd imagined it was that really long flower with the purple tops, or perhaps I've misunderstood, you know, rookie error. Don't really know what it is I'm buying. And then this one here. I will say that's put on a bit of growth. I must have bought these a couple of weeks ago and I didn't quite know what to do with them. So on our patio, we've got um, quite a wide, shallow pot that's got plants in it. Most It's, it's sort of becoming a little herb garden. It's, I saw chives in it and a mint. My husband buys his herbs from the supermarket because they're relatively inexpensive in the potted ones and then he pots them out. So I had just rested these on the surface so I sort of knew where they were going to be. And then this is Dianthus. So Dianthus, I'm looking around. So Dianthus is what we know as carnation, sweet William. Um, it doesn't, the leaves don't look like anything I'm familiar with. I'm desperately searching around the other side of the garden because we have got some sweet Williams. And pinks have more of a, 
um, a sort of sharp, bushy foliage. I'm not quite sure whether that is actually what it says it is. And this one here, oh, GM. GM Irish Bradshaw. So I do like a GM. A little bit like the growing habit of a native geranium. And I'm regretting now the geranium I did plant in my excitement when I went to garden nursery. I thought I was buying a Cranesbill geranium with quite long stems and it looks like a Cranesbill geranium but when I actually look at the label it's not. I think it's more of a ground cover rather than height. So I do not want ground cover. I want height so I can cut length for my flowers. So there we go. That's another job before I go in and have my breakfast. But let me bring you round to the garden and I can show you where my error, my, you can tell where I've gone wrong with my mulching. <laughs> because can you see this? This is my native geranium. So it's growing back again not as much as there was there originally. It's sort of lying this edge. It's, um, this is where the tortoise was, and it had a little enclosure around it, and then to soften the enclosure, we'd allow the native geranium to grow. Now, this is quite a nice variety. There's another one just here. I'm gonna pull it off. But I don't like quite as much. It's got a really insignificant flower. And another thing that I'm learning, or I've learned from this, is that if you do, see, I've always been scared of cutting things back and um, you know digging things out because I wanted the flowers to last forever and ever and it seems counterintuitive when you've got something that's still looking beautiful that you actually go back and you you cut it all back for that sort of second flush I don't know whether this is going to flower again but certainly it is putting on some lovely growth so I think it's doing that because, yes, if I was doing a proper no-dig method, I should have taken my sister's advice and laid over cardboard everywhere and then put my 10 centimetres down. I didn't because this area was quite clear of vegetation. I just put down my five centimetres because I was too lazy and impatient to struggle with the compost heap to get a deeper amount. So I've got these patches here. So I'm quite happy to have some patches, but what I want to make sure that I do, and it looks like it's coming back with really vigorous growth. And wouldn't it be lovely if it came back into flower? This is a, a nice variety. It has a little flower on stems about this long, quite an intense, deep pink. So it's nice to have it's jam jar flowers the stems aren't ultra long so no good for bouquet making but certainly nice for little poses and jam jar flowers so i want to make sure that it doesn't take over again so i'm going to do some spot weeding with my with my well either with my kitchen implements or i will find the trowel and do it so i'm quite happy to have a patch here and then can you see this patch over here by my newly planted hydrangea so i'm happy to have several clumps of it but i do not want it taking over everything because then i'm going to have the problem that i won't be able to plant or i won't feel i won't be able to plant my specimen flowers because there's too much coverage going on with other stuff so my form of gardening would be to allow the garden to do what it wants to do but to be more um to be stricter in terms of what I actually cut back, or what I allow to happen. Don't just let it do its own thing, to sort of curate it a little bit more. So what I'm going to do, because I am slowly expanding my width, I had this sort of thing that I would go up to here to begin with, where the um, rosemary and the Japanese maple is. But now that I've got this bit, I'm sort of coming out to my two roses that I've got, and the bay, I may start mulching, because I've already, you know, mulch light here, that I am going to, well, I've, I've got one wheelbarrow worth, or fill in that little bit. I'll see whether I can be bothered to do a second wheelbarrow worth, and that is the way I'm going to have to do it. I do not want to think, oh, today's a gardening day, and I have got to do, you know, 16 barrel loads of mulch. Well, listen, I haven't got 16 barrel loads in the, in the compost heap. But if I just set myself that task that, in the morning when I get up or in the evening in the cool of the day if I just get one more wheelbarrow full and put it on the garden well that's one more wheelbarrow full than I had the day before so that is what I'm going to do 
So would you like to see how well my flowers are going? There's another thing before we say goodbye is I am going to just slightly adjust one of my pots because, and look at here, I'm going to step on my stepping stones so I'm not compacting my soil, that um, I have turned my pot here because I've only got flower heads on this side and it happened to be the side it was over here before these flower heads and that was where the morning sunshine was hitting so I thought perhaps it wasn't getting enough sunshine so I've rotated it a bit and that's what I want to do with this pot here not that it's you know not getting the right amount of sunshine but I've planted my coriolopsis oh and it never gets what when I was out walking with my friends the other day um, I had great delight because we walked down a little passageway with people's gardens going onto the passage and I spotted somebody had planted Coriolops, Coriolops and I thought, I can't say the name properly, but I recognise it and it's like meeting friends, isn't it? You know, I've got that too. So I've got the Coriolopsis and I'm never going to remember the name of the, um, the white spike and my Astrantia, but they're all facing into the garden now my kitchen window is just there so what i'm going to do is i am going to rotate the tub so that i can see it from my kitchen window and i don't think that's going to have well hopefully it's not going to have too much of a an impact on their sort of little growing area, you know, the little microclimate. And while I'm here, I'm noticing that the Coriolopsis, Cori I don't know how you say that, needs deadheading. So I can just squeeze off the buds between my fingers and that is another little job. Now it may well be that I can do this. I wonder if I can do this. There's a little walkway behind me. It's like a raised bed that perhaps I can do this by leaning across, standing on the wall and leaning in. So another little job. It's got quite a nice scent to the, to the foliage here that I can just do. So next, you know, when I'm in the garden or just fiddling around, again, to stop it becoming this huge job that I have got to go out and deadhead my plants, that I can just do it in that 30 seconds it takes to walk past the plant to do it so again it's all these little tricks to make it feel as if i'm not actually doing the chore of gardening i'm just layering up in you know, 30 seconds 15 minutes so it doesn't become a really big problem so thank you so much for joining me live this morning if you have any advice, I'm quite well aware of the fact that if you're a gardener, you're probably rolling around laughing at me because you can't believe all those rookie mistakes I'm making. So if you do have any advice and comments, they will all be very gratefully received. So um, yeah, I'm going to finish off two jobs this morning and then dump my wheelbarrow load of um, mulch on the next bit of lawn and pot up those three perennials I bought into a single plot, pot so I can keep an eye on them, nurture them might I say, and hopefully this time next week they'll still be alive. And before I go, don't forget it's YouTube Flower Club tomorrow. So those of you who are in my YouTube Flower Arranging Club, my membership group where you pay a monthly fee, it's our monthly Flower Arranging Club. If I've got your email address I will have just, or actually, what's the time? Half past nine, you should be getting an email from me to remind you about Flower Club and just to remind you what you need to be, bring along with you. So it's one of those things where you can just sit and watch, um, you can ask questions as I go, and you could be creating and making alongside me or perhaps saving up the video to make your arrangement when you've got more time at some point in the future. So I am going to momentarily hang up my gardening gloves and I think I'm going to have a nice cup of tea and then work away in my garden, but really just for another 15 minutes in order that it doesn't become a chore and a drain on my enthusiasm. I'll see you next time.